in one of my favorite cities in the world, Montreal. Paul, you're welcome to our forum. Thank you. Thank you, Cameron, for inviting me to this forum. And I also want to thank the organizers of the forum for giving us this opportunity to share some thoughts about uh, art and sustainability, a topic that is close to my own heart. And uh, given the video this morning and the poem by Steve, I suspect it's also close to the hearts of many other speakers. Um, I also want to congratulate the World Dialogue Forum on its 10th anniversary and wish uh, many, many more anniversaries. Uh, on this issue of ecological crises that we are talking about this morning, I think dialogue is the only way forward, dialogue of civilizations that we are having here, but also dialogue with nature and dialogue with future generations. I hope the forum will continue and expand the dialogue to include nature and future generations more centrally. My talk today is about uh, visions of a new earth in responding to ecological crises. Uh, the conference brings together dialogue of civilizations at a time when civilizations are threatening the very ecosystem on which they survive. So we need creative and honest dialogue informed by science, religions, humanities, and the arts. And so I applaud the organizers for the, selecting this topic and focusing us on it. Uh, I want to also acknowledge uh, two pro programs and colleagues in those programs that I work with, uh, whose ideas and images I'm going to use in these presentations, particularly the work of Professor Vera Ivanaj, who's a chemical engineer but an artist, and you will see some of her paintings, including the one that you see up here. And secondly, I want to thank uh, NASA's uh, Low Earth Orbit Satellite Photography Project, which uh, over the last 30 years has given us some new pictures of the Earth that you will see in uh, slides that follow. You won't see any more words. There are just pictures in the slides, so you can listen to my words more carefully. So what I want to cover is uh, sort of at least get on the first page with regard to dialogue. We need to start at the same place. So I'll spell out for you in some numbers what I think is the problem of sustainability globally. And I'll talk about two visions of Earth, the scientific and technological vision being one, the religious and faith-based vision being the other, that have uh, directed. Uh, I will talk a little bit about the limitations of both these dialogues and propose art-based or an aesthetic vision. And then finally introduce a project that we are doing in France uh, on the International Research Chair for Art and Sustainable Enterprise. So what does it mean to sustain Mother Earth? I have to acknowledge with a confession that when I started my career, when I got out of engineering college 30 some 35 years ago, perhaps more, my ecological footprint was two tons of carbon. And I didn't hear the word sustainability, and I didn't know the problems of ecological crises. 35 years later, my eco footprint was 22 tons of carbon. I don't think I was any happier. I don't think I was, uh, I had understood sustainability very well. I had written several books on it, but still my eco footprint had gone 11 times. And it made me reflect that the more I understood in my head, cognitively, what sustainability was, the worse my behavior seemed to be if I just look at the ecological footprint of my own personal history. And that is what led me to thinking that cognitive understanding alone is not sufficient to achieve sustainable behaviors. We need to make a new emotional connection between humans and nature. And art as a repository of human emotions is one vehicle for making that reconnection. So the project I'm going to talk to you about is mostly uh, how art and arting for sustainability can bring about change in behavior. But what is the sustainability we are worried about? So basics everybody knows. 
We have a population of about seven some billion people going to be 9.5 billion in another 30 years. Our GDP is about 75 trillion US dollars and it is going to triple in size over the next 30 years. China alone will have about 125 trillion dollar GDP which is one and a half times today's global GDP. You can see the kind of challenges we are facing. The carbon intensity of this GDP, just to give you a few numbers, the parts per million of carbon that the Earth has developed under for millions of years is about 180 to 200 parts per million. When we discovered coal in 1750s, we started inching up because the carbon that we burn accumulates in the atmosphere and we went to about 280 parts per million of carbon. Today we are at 387 parts per million of carbon and we are going towards four, five, 600 parts per million depending on which projection of IPCC you want to believe. If we don't control it, at about 425 parts per million, the world changes. You don't have the agricultural productivity we are accustomed to, it'll drop by 20%. 200 million people will have to move because sea levels will rise. There will be huge migration challenges. Viruses that cause diseases, the virus vectors completely switch. So diseases that are unknown in the advanced industrial countries uh, or known only in, in developing countries will move across. So we're, we're looking for havoc and it's not too far away. Unfortunately, we are going still in the wrong direction. We are using technologies that are more carbon intensive. Just to give you one number that I picked up recently, carbon emissions increased by 4.4% between 2008 and 2010, while the GDP of the world increased only 3.9%. This is after 20 years of Rio, where we had agreed among the nations of the world that we would limit carbon and reduce it by 10% of 1990 levels. So we are obviously going in the wrong direction. We need to change in behavior. We need to change our institutions. And in some ways, we need to change the civilization that we have built. One of my favorite writers, Mike, uh, uh, Michael Curtis, in a book called uh, The Barbaric Heart, said that the, at the core of every civilization is a form of barbarism. Barbarism that involves taking. We take from each other. We take from nature, and we don't seem to acknowledge any responsibility for overcoming this barbarism. So one of the elements of the, this dialogue of civilization, I hope, will be to try to shape a new civilization, not just talk about talking between civilizations that, to me, are rotten at the core, but create a new civilization that is more eco-sensitive, more sensitive to the needs of others, and more sensitive to nature. I'm going to try to rush through because I realize I'm only on my second of nine sides. So the two major dialogues that have been going on are dialogue of science and the dialogue or the vision of religion and faith-based organizations. Both of them are represented over here. I won't say too much about it. I, just to sort of the bottom line for me is neither of them, neither of those two dialogues has helped us achieve any measure of sustainability if you just look at the numbers. So science has its problems. It is not a perfect thing. It is relatively new. It is kind of stuck in its own consciousness, a rather technocratic one, an industrial one, and in many ways is a source of many of the problems of sustainability. Uh, oh, I, I forgot to explain to you what these other pictures are, because that's really my message. It's not in what I'm saying. So the pictures that you see uh, on the, these images they are images of the Earth, and the project that they come from is a project to revisualize how we talk about Earth and nations. You will notice none of them involve individual nations. They all involve bioregions around rivers, around, and they're beautiful. They look like abstract paintings. So you can, re it's an attempt in our project to review the world, not in terms of nations and political jurisdictions and legal borders but in the form in an aesthetic value judgment about what we all live with. Okay, so from science, the, <clears throat> the limitations of science are well known. I won't harp on them too much. I will say a few words about limitations of religion, having been brought up in an orthodox and uh, very religious family myself, 
and then later on developing an allergy to religions and faith-based organizations, particularly the dogmatic institutional side of it, I have to say that I am disenchanted than being enchanted. That is what I thought religions were supposed to do. But they are being in some ways usurped by political interests, by extremism, by all kinds of conflicts, and for years have, have been source of wars and conflicts. And I don't think we can go to religion for a final solution of the ecological crisis. So I'll move off from there to talk about art as a rescue for humanity. And I, by art, I don't mean what you see in museums. I don't mean uh, high art, which requires a lot of skills and artists and painters. Art, to me, is a form of knowledge. It's a form of knowing. It's an aesthetic inquiry uh, that uh, all of us have as an instinct. It's across the world and across history. Art has always been there. And it serves a survival function. It's an instinct. Those communities that told the better fables and stories about the saber-toothed tiger and about the cliff were able to protect their children from being eaten by the saber-toothed tiger. So stories didn't emerge for fun. They emerged as a survival thing. Nor did music, nor did painting. All of these have survival values. That's what I mean by art. Art is an instinct. There's actually a book by the title, Art Instinct, by Dennis Dutton, a New Zealand philosopher that I would highly recommend. And since I've been shown the time, I'm going to run to the project we are doing. What we are doing is sort of discounting that science uh, is going to solve problems. We have turned to art, and we use aesthetic inquiry. We use, uh, and we're, we're collecting examples from around the world. We have a database now of several hundred projects where, where artists and non-artists, or so-called non-artists, I believe everyone is an artist, but where art is being used as a form of knowledge to improve ecological conditions, whether they are ecological landscapes, recovering land from, uh, or making people aware of the ecological conditions around them. Uh, I just give you here an example, and all I, I want to point out is the database is public. Anybody who wants to see what kind of uh, projects are being done, and these are global projects all, all over the country, all over the world, where art is being used as a mechanism for changing human behavior, for changing ecological conditions. And uh, if I had time, I would have shown you these websites, but if you want uh, to go in deeper, all of it is available in the presentation. So what have we learned from these? My last slide. Some early lessons, the data has been collected, uh, we are uh, categorizing the data. We are, we are learning some interesting things. Uh, and I'll only highlight one or two of them and then I'll close up. So first of all, we have learned that uh, art makes unconventional ideas feasible. Many projects that were not funded by government because uh, of budgetary limitations or bureaucratic rules were passed as a result of an artistic component. So to us, art is a way of enabling uh, projects that involve environmental restoration. A second thing we find about these projects it, that it is the commitment of individuals that is bringing about these projects. It is not the government, it is not business corporations, it is people. And some of these people, some of these artists, are starving on, while they're going through these projects, but their energy keeps pushing through the system, keeps pushing the barriers, and they're able to accomplish amazing things as a result. So personal commitment, a point that Steve and other speakers also raised earlier. Um, and then finally, let me say a word about uh, art and spirituality, because to me, I think we are looking for making a reconnection to ourselves, to nature, and to others. And this form of spirituality is something that art can serve as a vehicle for. So thank you very much. There's a lot more. There are dozens of papers on this project, so you don't have to listen to me to get it. Please let me know, and I'll be happy to send you further information. Thank you. Thank you.